Hey Todd, I'm going and looking for a gym actually. I hear you're You've joined a gym. Which one? Yeah, actually, there's a real nice gym downtown that just opened um, about maybe a month ago, two months ago. It's really oh, nice. Okay. What's the name of it? Uh, the name is Fitness Club. Ah, yeah. good name. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and uh, it pretty much has everything. I mean, it has, uh, you know, free weights, of course, and it yes. has all the latest machines. Oh, good. Yeah, actually, some of the machines are kind of tricky. I really don't know how they work yet. <laughs> so I have, to, I have to ask the staff. So but it's more than a treadmill. It's a whole big machine that you don't know what to do. Exactly. I'm actually afraid to get on the thing. I don't want to break <laughs> it. You know? Is there people there that can help you? Yeah, actually, um, that's part of the problem is you can't, use any of the equipment unless you get trained for it they're really oh. specific oh, okay. so you have to have guidance it's kind of annoying actually because yeah. you know everything they have a system and they know based on you know your membership what machines you can use and what you can't and yeah. oh, okay but what happens if like i've been to a gym before do i still need to get the training before i start yeah that's how i was i told them that i'd you know had been lifting weights for a while and they yeah. didn't care so you have to get certified to use all the equipment. It's kind uh, of inconvenient. Okay. So do they have classes, though? <laughs> they do. Actually, they have uh, pretty much everything. They have yoga, kickboxing, spin classes, dancing. So, um, And the, the schedule looks you know, pretty diverse. Oh, that's good. I do prefer classes than the weights. Yeah. Only one thing that's bad about the classes, though, is that because it's new – and it's a new gym, there's lots of people, and it looks like it's pretty crowded in there. I think oh. you have to reserve what classes you're going to join. Oh, really? Yeah, it's not terrible. Oh, geez. I usually just like to walk in. <laughs> right, right. I yeah, know. when you feel like going to the gym, you go. <laughs> right, right. Hmm. One thing that is nice, though, is they have, um, they have a, an actual gym floor, like a basketball gym. So you oh, can play yes. basketball. They have volleyball tournaments. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, if you like more traditional sports... Like tennis, they also yep. have tennis courts. You can do that as well. Oh, that's good. I do like tennis. I love tennis, actually. Mm. <laughs> well, actually, if you're interested, um, I'd be glad to, you know, take you down to the gym and, and show you, you know. Yep. I think you get a free trial workout. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. good. So how much would it cost per month? Well, because it's new, it's kind of expensive. Oh. Um, it costs about $50 a month. Oh, wow. Yeah. But if you buy a membership, a two-year membership, mm -hmm. you can get a two-year membership, I think, for $800. So it's, it saves you some money, so it's yeah. kind of reasonable. And I suppose if you pay for two, two, yeah, you know you have to go then. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's um, $800 for two years, $500 for one year, or $50 a month. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, one thing that's really cool, too, is they have a social center. They have, like, a, a an area where you can get, like, fruit drinks and coffee and stuff like that and just hang out. <laughs> it's quite nice. That's good. So after after the workout, go and have coffee. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, so, yeah, I'd love to come and have a look at it. Okay, well, uh, next week, anytime, just give me a call. I'll take you there. All right, great. Thanks. Now, you were saying that you worked in radio and at a young age, but then you went back to it much later in life. Can you talk about that? I did. Well, when I was 21 years old, I got headhunted to do a show. This show was basically a freelance show that had to be done in three different languages at the same time. So the range of audience was quite broad. And the, the show was basically anything I wanted, anything I wanted to talk about. So quite often I talked about music, current, event, current events, Anything political, anything non-political, anything that, that came to my mind I would talk about. So what were the three languages of the show? Hindi, Punjabi, and obviously English. Okay, and uh, what was the city? Where was this at? This was in Auckland. Okay, so this was one of these kind of blended radio shows where you slip from one language to another? It, it was. Well, the show was catering for everybody basically. So the criteria was speak in a way that makes people understand even if they don't speak the language. So the trick was to say one third in English, the rest in Hindi and Punjabi where I could, and somehow it just made sense. How do you go about doing that? Like did you plan it or does it just kind of roll off the for roll me, off your tongue? For me I think it's quite natural because my parents speak in Hindi and Punjabi and so for me English is quite natural and so are the other two languages. Blending them together was never a problem. 
Now, when you hear languages uh, being switched back and forth like that, are you conscious of it, or sometimes are you not even conscious that you're speaking one language or the other? I don't think I'm conscious of it at all. It just happens. It's a slip of tongue. I, all three languages I'm quite fluent in. So for me, to switch from one to the other is, is just a natural course of a day. So since you have experience in the music industry, what do you think makes a good DJ? A good DJ is one that's neutral when it needs when they need to be, and one who can switch sides very quickly and make things controversial from being neutral. What I mean by that is if you have an interesting topic and a caller calls you up and is very positive about it, a good DJ would be able to flip it over very quickly and say something that would make it controversial. Now, do you think there's a certain balance, like how much you should talk and how much music should be played? And There is absolutely a balance. Quite often people listen to radio for music. So you need to make sure that your music ratio is more than how much you talk. But the amount you talk has to be interesting, but quite limited. All right. Thanks a lot. No, you're welcome. So, Shafani, you were saying that you actually worked in radio from an early age. Can you talk a little bit about that? That's right. Well, I worked on the radio at the age of 12. What basically happened was that I used to call up the radio station quite a lot, answer questions and quizzes and all that sort of stuff. And uh, one of the announcers thought my voice was nice and so wanted me to come and work for him. Without realizing that I was 12 years old, he called me in and had me on. So, were you a little scared? I mean, you're only 12. It was very daunting at first. So the first couple of days, I had no idea what was going on. There was a massive microphone in front of my face, and I was told to make this show fun and interesting. So yes, it was very daunting. Did you have any prep, or did they just stick you in front of the mic and have you react? No, actually, there, were, there, was no prompt, there were no prompts. It was all up to me. I had to come up with stuff on the spot, which was quite easy, really, because the topics were simple. It was m mainly about music. Oh, like, like teen stuff? Yeah, exactly. Or anything that people called up and talked about. It's a very, very childish stuff, but mainly geared at teenagers. Uh, how did your parents feel about it? Very proud of me, obviously. At the age of 12, their daughter was a DJ. Uh, what could be better than that? So they really enjoyed it. I remember they would listen to it every single time, record it, and then listen to it over and over again when they could. Oh, that's fantastic. So uh, were you like a little celebrity at your school? I ended up becoming one. A lot of my friends also did the same recording of my voice on the radio. It, w it was a big thing to be a radio person and being only 12. So my friends thought it was absolutely fantastic, and they would take it to school and quite often play it around. So yeah, I ended up getting a celebrity status. So when you were young and you were this DJ, did you envision yourself of being a DJ for a long time? Actually, no, I hadn't. I, I really enjoyed it, had a lot of fun, but it was a hobby. It was never something I wanted to do as, as a profession. So in the future, if you had a, a, a child and they wanted to do this, would you encourage them to do it? I absolutely would, because if they enjoy it and they enjoy it so much that they want to take it up as a career, why not? With me, it was a hobby. Now, what about podcasts? Like, would you encourage young people to maybe have their own podcast? I think that's a fantastic idea. I think it's really good to be able to express yourself. And through podcasts, they can do exactly that. Hey, Warren. Hey, how's it going? Good. I thought today we could talk about childhood dreams. When you were 10 years old, what did you want to be when you grew up? Right. Uh, well, actually, it's a little embarrassing. I, I wanted to be a truck driver. I thought it would be really neat because you can just travel around everywhere and see different places all the time, and you're always on the move. Uh, but, you know, I, I didn't become a truck driver. No, you didn't become a truck driver. Uh, why, why is that? When did your dream change? Well, uh, probably when I was around 15, I, I thought it would be a lot cooler to be a rock star. Rock star. Yeah, rock star. I, I really liked uh, electric guitar at the time, and um, a lot of my friends were into music as well. So I, I didn't actually start a band, but uh, I played with a lot of different people, and um, sometimes I would play with some bands, but I never really stuck to it. But I, I did keep playing guitar, and I 
ended up getting pretty good. What kind of rock star did you want to be? Did you want to be like a heavy metal rock star or a grunge rock star? Uh, well, I guess versatile would be the word. I, I like playing a lot of heavy stuff and uh, maybe uh, maybe some, some folk music as well. So kind of uh, eclectic. So maybe a hippie rock star? Yeah, maybe a hippie. So then when you were 20, did you still want to be a rock star? No, I didn't, but I still played guitar then. I, I actually wanted to be a classical guitarist by then. Okay. what What is classical guitar? Well, it's funny you say that because it's not just classical music. Uh, classical guitar is, um, for one thing, it's a type of guitar. It, it has uh, nylon strings, not the steel strings like you see on a folk guitar. Okay. And there's different styles you can play on it, uh, like Spanish music or flamenco, uh, South American music, some classical music like Beethoven and things like that, or Baroque music like Does it Bach. have a singer with it? Or? Uh, sometimes there are singers. Usually uh, it's solo, uh, but you can play some chamber music with, with other instruments as well. And, uh, yeah, I played some, some pieces with uh, vocalists, but it wouldn't be pop music. And so now you're older. Mm -hmm. uh, are, did your dream come true? Did you become a classical guitarist? I did, uh, but I actually decided to change my dream after I became a classical guitarist. So what's your dream now? Well, my dream now is to become a, a university professor. Oh, and are you making steps to achieve that dream? I am, actually. I'm working at a university now, not as a professor, uh, as, as a part-time lecturer, but uh, I'm taking some courses and studying hard and hoping that my future will, will, uh, will allow me to become a professor. Okay. Well, unless you change your dream again, I bet you'll achieve your dream more. So good luck. Oh, great. Thank you. So, Lindsay, what about your dreams? What What did you want to be when you were 10 years old? Well, when I was 10 years old, I wasn't very realistic, but I knew I wanted to be very powerful. So I thought the dream job would be uh, Wonder Woman. She can fly anywhere. Uh, she has the powers to do good and to help everyone. And she's very uh, badass. So I wanted to be just like her. Unfortunately, wow. it didn't come true, as I'm not Wonder Woman right now. No, I can see that, but it seems like you had a, a good imagination as a kid. But I guess that, that probably changed as you got older. What about when you were 15? Well, then when I was 15, I still wanted to be very powerful um, and very strong, but I had a more realistic idea of what I wanted to be. But I still didn't know a lot about the world, so I just wanted to be a very powerful businesswoman. I had no idea what kind of business, and I had no idea what that actually meant, but I wanted to wear an all-black suit and have a briefcase and go to work in a nice office and drive a nice car and do something that was very powerful. But I had no idea really what a powerful businesswoman does. Oh, well, that seems like a pretty good dream for a 15-year-old. But I guess you probably had a better idea when you were 20, so what about then? So when I was 20, then I still wanted to be powerful and strong. I guess you can see the common theme here. Uh, but then I had even more realistic idea of actual real professions. So at that time, I was quite uh, social. I really enjoyed going to parties. Uh, and I was living in New York at the time. So I thought the perfect job for me would be a public relations specialist. Uh, I thought I could be one of those people that plans parties or um, does handles the PR, the publicity for celebrities. Uh, I had a dream of maybe working for Madonna or working for a famous TV show and handling all, all their publicity representation. Oh, well, that's great. It seems like you, you had a better idea by the time you were 20. But I guess you probably have some dreams now even. So what kind of dreams do you have now? Well, then, uh, when I was 20, I was quite uh, egotistical. I just wanted, only thought about myself and how I could have more money and be more powerful. But then something changed when I started traveling and seeing the world where I decided that I'd rather have a job that does something good for the world and gives back to the community and to the people. Um, so now I'm a teacher, and I really enjoy that. 
the idea of making a difference in, in people's lives. And in the future, maybe when I get older, I hope to start an animal shelter so that um, when animals are left on the street or abandoned, they can come to my shelter and I can provide a happy home for them. Wow, that's a great vision for the future. Thanks. So we're talking about camp today. Uh, did you ever go to camp when you were a kid? I did. I usually went to cub camp, you know, like Boy Scouts. Okay. Was it during the summer? Yeah, it would always be in the summer. And was it for a week or a month? or? I, I can't recall. It probably was about a week. About a week? What would you do at cub camp? Oh, we do different things. Um, one thing I remember is uh, archery. Archery. Yeah, like bows and arrows. So we would have uh, a target, and uh, we, we would practice trying to hit the target, and I was really bad at it. I, <laughs> I remember always, um, it's quite difficult, and I would hurt my, my arm okay. with, with, the, with the bow. Um, but then after the, we were trying to get the target, I remember we did distance as well. And I was actually pretty good at that. I, I figured out how to get a long, uh, long shot away and... I, I think I, I might be lying, but I think I, I maybe got the longest shot than anyone else. Oh, wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, okay, besides archery, were there other games you play or sports you did? Yeah, well, we would uh, learn how to uh, canoe and uh, we, we'd swim and uh, we'd go on hikes. We, we'd learn how to navigate through the forest with a compass. Okay. Things like that. Did you learn how to start fire without matches? We did, yeah. We would uh, use um, two sticks, rub them together, start a fire. Wow. Yeah. Uh, what would you guys do at night? Would you um, play games or have campfires? Yeah, we'd always have a campfire at night. Uh, we'd sing some songs like Kumbaya, and wow. uh, yeah, put on some skits and tell ghost stories. But my favorite thing to do at the campfire was uh, roast marshmallows. Oh, that's the best. Yeah, we, I'd, I'd spend hours trying to find the perfect stick mm. to, to carve and uh, roast marshmallows on. And sometimes we'd even make the, the chocolate s'mores with the marshmallows. Oh, yummy. Uh, so that food was good. How was the other food? Um, I don't have any memories of it being good. So I don't think it was very good we we would all eat together in in a, a mess hall much like yourself and uh, actually i remember getting really sick one time and uh, my parents had to come and pick me up and i think i i got a bit of food poisoning oh wow from yeah. the food in yeah. the scout camp yeah, wow right. okay um final question so you were away from your family right mm -hmm. was that hard or easy oh it was it was easy i i remember feeling a little freer and uh, more independent, away from my parents, less rules, less regulations. You weren't homesick at all? I, no, I never did get homesick. Even when my parents came to pick me up that time when I was sick, I, I really didn't want to go home. Oh, too yeah. bad you got food poisoning. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Warren. So, Lindsay, we're both teachers, and, you know, sometimes our, our students uh, go off to camp over, over the summer break. Did you ever go to camp when you were younger? I did go to camp. The camp I went to is called Pilgrim Pines. Oh, what was that like? Uh, it was great. Uh, it was one week away from my family, and each person got to take care of an animal. Uh, some people took care of horses. Some people took care of sheep. Uh, but I got the lucky task of taking care of Xanadu the llama. <laughs> What was that like? Oh, it was awesome. I, when I was a kid, my favorite animal was a llama. So um, that's why we looked into this camp to begin with. And uh, I had to brush it, uh, and I had to feed the llama. And it was such a sweet llama that uh, I really fell in love with it. And every day I'd wake up and feed the llama and brush it. And then uh, in the afternoon, I'd also come and visit the llama. Xanadu was his name. But um, a couple of times he got mad. I'm not exactly, I can't remember why actually he was upset. But uh, when llamas are mad, uh, do you know what they do? I don't know. They actually spit. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, and you have to be, and then they get 
if they spit at you, that means they're really upset and they can be dangerous. I mean, I was only 10 at the time, so the llama was a lot bigger than me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one time it, it spit at me and the spit got stuck in my hair and it was this really thick, gross, uh, mucusy spit. Oh. Um, and that really uh, struck an image in my mind. I can't ever kind of forget that llama spitting at me. And then after, I think for a day, I was afraid of the llama. Um, and then my counselor, my camp counselor, who was in charge of all the children, uh, had a talk with me and told me how, you know, sometimes llamas get mad, just like people get mad. And mm-hmm. that I need to forgive the llama. And uh, I did. And then the next day I went and, uh, and fed the llama and brushed the llama and everything was back to normal. But it was a really good experience to learn how to take care of a pet mm-hmm. um, and good experience to be away from my family for the first time. Mm. Um, so I guess there were other kids at the camp too. Did you guys all eat together? Uh, yeah, we had the, like a mess hall, they called it, which is basically a cafeteria. The food was disgusting. I remember <laughs> losing a lot of weight when I came home mm-hmm. and my mom would uh, send me packages of chocolate and cookies and I would eat it all. Uh, but yes, we all ate together this like gross cafeteria slob food, uh, like sloppy Joe for, uh, lunch right. or, you know, just imagine like turkey and gravy for dinner, but the turkey was like, kind of a blue color or something. Mm-hmm. Everything was just a little bit gross. But and at one time we had a food fight and that was absolutely <laughs> amazing. Um, this one kid get, got upset. The other kid threw some mashed potatoes and the next thing you know, turkey's flying, mashed potatoes flying, everything, everyone's getting involved. And uh, that was really fun, the food fight. Hi, Jake. How are you today? Good. How are you, Shirley? Mm, not too bad, thanks. <laughs> Um, I thought we might talk about folk heroes today. Sure. And I don't really know much about American folk heroes. Are there sure. any that you have a favorite? or? Well, actually, my hometown in the United States happens to be known as one of the hometowns for Paul Bunyan. Oh, ah, I think I've heard of that name, but I don't know anything about him. Paul Bunyan was a lumberjack. Like, he would cut down trees Okay. And he, he was supposedly a very giant man. He was huge. And I don't know if he actually ever lived in some time in the past, but maybe he was just a very large man, but somehow the stories have been passed down to say that he was as large as a house or as large as a skyscraper, or it completely depends on who you ask. <laughs> wow. So not sure whether he's a mythical character or a real character? No one really knows for sure. Hmm. What did he do? Well, um, well, some people say that he took his axe and he dragged it behind his back across the United States and he made the Mississippi River. Ah, so it's a kind of story to explain why something exists. That's part of it. And also, uh, he had a pet, too. His, His pet is very famous. And what kind of pet? His pet was an ox, but it wasn't just an ordinary ox. It was a blue ox, and it was also oversized okay. to fit with his size. What did his pet do? Well, his pet, I think, would just carry lumber for him or something. So about when did this story start? I mean, when when did Paul Bunyan become famous or when did people know about that story? Well, I'm not exactly sure, but like your country, the United States is a very young country and has a very young history since the European settlers came there. So I think it's maybe from a couple hundred years ago, maybe at the most. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. You've lived in three different parts of the world, so is there any difference between each part in terms Mm. of physical contact? contact? Yeah, I have lived in Hong Kong, Guam, and the U.S. Um, Hong Kong is in Asia, Guam is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and the U.S. is American culture. So in Hong Kong, I think most people would not touch each other, just give each other a little bow. I find that a bow is very common in Asia. Um, If you're very good friends, you wouldn't really hug. Hugging, I think, is a very American thing to do. I think you would just touch each other on the shoulder or give each other a side embrace, um, a mini hug. 
in Guam, you would definitely greet your friends and family with a ch- uh, a kiss on the cheek. Um, a handshake is much too formal for island culture because island culture is so relaxed and laid back. You would only do a handshake with business partners or in a really formal setting. But usually a kiss on the cheek is what you receive and give when you see your family and friends. In the U.S., hugging is most common, I think, for friends and family. But if you're not friends and family, a handshake would probably be the most common. Mm, is the ha- are handshakes always the same, or is there different styles of handshake? Hmm. From what I've observed, um, Guam has American culture, so Guam handshakes and U.S. handshakes are the same. I think in Hong Kong, it's got a bit a British background, so that's also very similar. I don't see any difference with the handshake. Hmm. So, what about young people? Is there a different way they interact physically with each other? Yes, definitely. Um, in Guam, I always see people do a fist bump um, for close buddies of theirs. Um, girls would definitely hug and give each other a kiss. Um, in Hong Kong, I don't see the fist bump often. I don't think I've ever seen it at all, actually. Um, but for close friends, I think a side embrace or a semi embrace would happen, but mostly just some form of touch or acknowledgement of the other person. I think it's also very common for people of the same sex to hold hands in Asia mm. and just be friends. Um, women and women hold each other's hands if they are very, very, very good friends. And uh, it, it's apparently very normal. I don't know about a guy holding another guy's hand, but if a woman and a woman hold each other's hands, it does not signal that they are together as a couple. It might just signal that they are very, very good friends or sisters. In Australia, that would be very strange. Yes, it would, wouldn't it? Even in America and Guam. So, Nick, let's talk about touching and holding hands and physical touch uh, with your significant other. Do you and your partner hold hands when you go out in the street? Hmm. We hold hands all the time. Initially, we, uh, when we first went out, holding hands was the first thing we did. They've progressively moved on from there to kissing. But holding hands was certainly the first thing we did in our relationship. Do you remember when you first tried to hold her hand or did she try to hold your hand first? Mm, I made the first move. We were sitting on the couch watching a movie and I was getting a bit nervous and I couldn't quite, um, couldn't quite concentrate on the movie. So I moved my hand over to hers and she reciprocated and... And moved on from there, so. You know, that's funny that you bring that up because one of the most common moves um, that is made fun of in movies as well is when the guy takes a big yawn, a fake yawn, and he opens his arms wide and places it around the girl's shoulder and thus embraces her. But he had to do it because he yawned. (laughs) <laughs> in my experience like my first um my first hug was like that as well so it was just a bit of an excuse to I was reaching for something and then suddenly my hand went around and she didn't mind so <laughs> that's it was a very good, good. <laughs> and what about mm, kissing do mm. you kiss a lot in public in the streets uh, rarely in public because we find it makes other people uncomfortable. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. I find that when I see couples kissing or making out in public, I usually think to myself, why don't you get a room? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to see that. You just want to be having a conversation with them or yeah, you don't want them to be constantly distracted. 
So, Shirley, we were talking about childhood memories. Uh, and you're from Scotland. There's anything from your childhood that you can tell us? Um, I, I know. I've got a really funny story, actually. Maybe I was about 10 years old or something. And uh, we used to have this, this little kind of shack in the countryside that we were dragged to every weekend and uh, away from civilization, you know, and no running water, no electricity. So we kids had to make our own fun. I've got uh, my brothers, myself, and a couple of cousins. We would always go there at weekends or school holidays or something. And, um, I mean, one of the highlights of our weekends was to go to the Sunday, Sunday school, the Sunday morning church service. And the reason, one of the reasons this was uh, attractive to the kids was because they bribed us to go there by giving us sweets when we got there. <laughs> so it was great. So we always went anyway. It was a church service for about an hour and singing hymns and stuff like that. Anyway, this one Sunday we arrived early, about half an hour early. There was nobody there. The church wasn't open yet. So it was, as most people know, it rains a lot in Scotland. So on that rainy day, we all were wearing uh, our cagoules, which is a kind of a rain jacket with a big pocket in the front. And while we were waiting for everybody else to arrive, we started just kind of playing around in the trees. There was a little river nearby. And it was at the time of year when the tadpoles were turning into baby frogs. So we got this crazy idea to collect all these I mean I'm talking hundreds of frogs were around so we all got a big handful of baby frogs uh, put them in this big pocket of our cagoule went off into church so there we are we're kind of in the middle of the crowd you know we weren't at the front or the back kind of in the middle and uh, everybody's standing up singing the hymns and really getting into you know the church singing and stuff like that and then we decided that we would uh get the frogs out <laughs> so each of us one at a time each of us kids one at a time kind of crouched down as if we were tying our shoelace and let all these frogs out of our pockets so these tiny little frogs started jumping all over the church and uh, there's all these ladies in their Sunday best and started squealing and screaming and the the minister didn't know what was going on and he's trying to keep everybody calm and we're just singing along with the hymn, you know, we are really innocent and they had no idea because they didn't see us do it, so they had no idea what had happened. And um, yeah, I mean, we got away with it. We didn't get told off because we didn't get caught. And uh, yeah, when we after the church service, you know, we had such a laugh after the church service. And yeah, that's one of my my greatest childhood memories, getting up to mischief with my brothers. Monica, you mentioned a farm homestay in New Zealand. Have you ever actually lived on a farm? Um, I haven't lived on a farm as such, but I've visited family friends who have lived on farms. Oh, did you like it? Yeah, I remember loving visiting um, my family friends on farms. Yeah, especially riding horses. I oh. loved riding horses when I was young. So are you uh, good? Are you an equestrian professional? Um, I wouldn't say that. I do remember one time um, my mother always seems to tell people this story about when I was young um, and we were at her friend's farm. I was on a horse and uh, the horse took off and I was only about, I think, 10 at the time and I was hanging off the side of this oh. horse and my mother was really worried for me. Yeah. And then when the horse finally stopped, she, um, you know, she came running up and asked me if I was okay and things. And apparently I said to her, oh, it's okay. I wanted it to go fast. <laughs> That's cute. You're lucky you didn't get hurt, though. Yeah, well, I guess I just didn't sense the danger. Actually, I kind of grew up on a farm. Uh, my grandfather had a ranch growing up, so I spent every summer on his ranch. So I have quite the, I don't know, I guess I have a lot of experience. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I remember... When I was young, I thought the life on the farm was just the best. I mean, I had it so good. And I loved everything about living on a farm. And I thought when I was going to get older, I would want to be on a farm. But now that I'm older, I, I couldn't imagine doing it ever again. 
Oh, what can't you imagine doing? Uh, I don't know. I, I guess I just couldn't imagine all that work. Um, and I think I'm just so addicted to city life or suburban life uh, and living in a house and just you know, doing work on computers and things like that. I, I couldn't go back to that lifestyle. But when I was young, I have to admit, I, I enjoyed it a lot. So how about you? Could you see yourself moving and living on a farm? Um, well, yeah, I think my thoughts are similar to yours in that um, I'm very used to being inside using a computer and I'm used to um, a very different lifestyle to one that involves being on a farm. But yeah, I've never had um, a long period of time where I've stayed on a farm like you, so yeah, maybe it's a bit different for me. So Monica, you are from New Zealand? Yes, that's right. So for people going to New Zealand, what would you recommend? What are three or four places that you must see in New Zealand? Oh, okay. Three or four places you must see. Well, depends what you're looking for, really. I think a lot of people that come to New Zealand enjoy an outdoor lifestyle. So there's lots of outdoor activities and places you can go to to enjoy in New Zealand. Um, personally, I find the South Island of New Zealand very scenic in comparison to the North Island. So for me, um, a must-do is the west coast of the South Island. It's very pretty. The west coast. Yeah. Um, in particular, there's two glaciers, Franz Josef and Fox Glaciers, um, which are very stunning to look at. And you can either have a look at them by foot or you can pay for a helicopter ride that takes you up and um, shows you an aerial view of them. Now, do people ever walk across the glaciers? Um, there are guides that can walk you across. Yeah, I haven't done it personally, but um, it is possible. So what else would you recommend for New Zealand? What other places should people see? Um, I think... If you want to see, um, let me think, rural New Zealand, it's quite a nice idea to drive the length of the country and then you can see um, the interesting farming that has taken place, um, in particular in the South Island, the lower part of the South Island and um, a lot of the North Island as well. Um, there's a lot of sheep in New Zealand and there's a lot of cattle as well. So... I think it is always interesting to go for a drive and to see that firsthand. So you just start up in Auckland in the north and drive all the way down south? Yeah, well, there's many ways you can do it, but um, I recommend one way of doing it is to arrive in Auckland and to um, have an experience of a big city, well, a big city for New Zealand, and then drive down the centre of the North Island and maybe have a uh, farming experience somewhere um, there's a lot of farm stay opportunities available for tourists who come to New Zealand so depending on how you do it you might want to stay two or three days with a family and experience a farming lifestyle um, so that's yeah one thing I'd recommend um, and another is to um, maybe go to a city like Rotorua which is uh, really in the centre of the North Island and experience um, Māori culture. Um, there's a Māori village there uh, near the Whakarewarewa forest, which hosts um, a lot of tourists, and you get to experience Māori waiata, which is uh, Māori songs, um, and you get to see um, the hot springs in New Zealand and thermal mud pools. Um, so, yeah, Rotorua is um, a nice city to go and visit. And um, then work your way down to the capital of New Zealand, which is Wellington. And I think if you want to experience the cafe lifestyle of New Zealand, that's a good place to go. So, Monica, a minute ago we were talking about Tai Chi and about how it helps longevity helps you live a long life 
Um, one time when I was in Bangkok, I met a guy and he was doing Tai Chi and he looked really young, but he said the secret to his old life, he said the secret to looking young was Tai Chi and cold showers. He took a cold shower every morning. Could oh, you, wow. Could you do that? Ah, uh, no, I don't think I could actually. Yeah, you know, I actually tried it for a while. I tried it for about a week and I did feel so energized. And it was easy in Bangkok because it's really warm, but I, I couldn't keep it up, especially now that I'm in the cold climate. There's no way. Yeah, I remember when I was young, my mother used to teach me to um, splash my face with cold water in the morning um, because she believed that helped wake you up. And I remember as a child not liking that at all because I just found it too cold. Right, right. So I preferred to splash my face with warm water. <laughs> So have you heard of any other secrets to having a long life? Um, yeah, I've heard of uh, quite a few different secrets to having a long life. Um, I guess one secret that a lot of different cultural groups seem to share is uh, diet. If you take the Japanese as an example, um, and Japanese people do have um, a long life expectancy in comparison to other people from other countries. Um, I think the Japanese eat a diet that's quite low in fat and reasonably low in salt as well. And I think their fluid intake is quite healthy um, because they drink a lot of green tea, which has antioxidants in it. And they drink a lot of miso soup which has a lot of vegetables in it and is made from fermented barley. So I think that's very healthy. I've also heard that people in the Mediterranean, they also often have a, a long lifespan in certain regions and maybe the combination of wine, just a little wine, not too much, but wine and olive oil and then a lot of uh, fish, seafood, is also maybe beneficial to a long life. Yeah, that's true. I've heard um, French people, for example, live a long life and that has often been said due to a glass of red wine a day. And um, I know people think differently about alcohol and its effect on the body um, these days. Right. Yeah, because alcohol used to be considered quite a bad thing. Um and discouraged in all forms but now people tend to think that a glass a day is actually quite beneficial to, to your health. I've also actually heard that laughter, that people that laugh a lot tend to live longer. Oh I, yeah I've heard that too actually because um, laughing releases natural endorphins and I think that helps you physiologically and also I think psychologically you're happier if you're laughing so yeah I think um, that long life is related to um, how you're feeling and I think um, a lot of it's psychological um, as well as um, physical for example how much you're eating and what types of food you're eating yeah I guess I'm kind of in the same boat but I just don't know if I laugh that much <laughs> maybe I'm in trouble <laughs> so Monica you do Tai Chi Ah, yes, I've just joined the Tai Chi Club. What made you join the Tai Chi Club? Well, I wanted to do something that was a lot different to what I usually do, which is high-impact sports like basketball and tennis. So you wanted to do something that was slower? Yeah, well, I don't usually um, enjoy exercise that is quite slow, um, such as yoga, but... I decided to join this club and I'm really enjoying it. So what exactly is Tai Chi? What, what do you do in Tai Chi? Well, there are different types of Tai Chi. Um, there's the original Tai Chi, which involves quite quick, fast movements. And then there's a slower form of Tai Chi, um, which is quite popular in Japan. I think it's called Mr. Young Tai Chi. And that involves very slow, um, pronounced movements. 
and that's the Tai Chi that I'm doing. Um, how do you feel like after you do Tai Chi? Do you feel tired? Do you feel energetic? Um, after I've done Tai Chi, I feel quite energetic, actually. Um, I don't really feel tired because I haven't had a really hard workout. But I feel that um, my mind is very relaxed and very focused and I'm very um, motivated to do whatever I need to do for the rest of the day. Now, uh, you actually are a tennis coach, so you teach sports. Would you recommend Tai Chi for other athletes? Yeah, I do recommend Tai Chi for other athletes. It's quite difficult to know exactly how you would benefit from Tai Chi and how it can directly relate to a specific sport. But I th I've heard that it works on your energy levels um, and focuses your mind so that everything's in balance. And I think that can help any kind of sport because um, even in a sport like tennis, um, it's important to have balance when you're hitting the ball, when you're um, volleying, when you're getting ready for a smash. It actually involves um, having balance in terms of where your center of gravity is. So yeah, the concepts are similar. Hey, George, actually, it's really, mm. yeah, it's funny that you mentioned relationships because I'm actually having a problem with Joe. Is that the guy with the curly hair? Yeah, that guy. Oh. He's really nice and everything, mm -hmm. but, like, I really don't think it's working out. Why? What, what's wrong? Well, he's really narrow-minded, and I'm really different. We just, he's nice and everything. He's mm -hmm. kind and sweet, and it's just not for me. Like, we're oh. totally different people. I see. Yeah. So what are you going to do? I think I have to rip the band-aid, and I th I think I'm just going to send him an email or something. An email? Yeah. But you've been dating for a while now, and y you like him, right? Yeah, like, we're so sweet together, but it's just, I, mean, I don't it... see a future. But isn't an email just a little too cold, and uh, yeah. you might tell other people about it. I mean, rumors spreading and whatnot. Ah, uh-huh. Okay, then what do you what do you think I should do? How should I do it? Well, you should probably just, you know, meet him face to face and... Oh, face to face. You know. Okay, what, where, where should I meet him? Like, do you think I should just invite him over to my place? Nah, you should probably do it in public where, you know... Oh, good, 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 good. I think that's I don't better. know, maybe a, that cafe. <laughs> oh, that cafe, yeah. Well, while I'm having my date, you could be breaking <laughs> up with your boyfriend. It'll be great. You're so mean. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was uncalled for. I I don't know what to say. What What do you think would hurt him less? I I gotta say, honesty would be the best policy. Honesty. Um, okay, so mm -hmm. this is what I'm going to say. Joel, you're great, mm -hmm. but we're not meant to be. I How's see. that? Yeah, it's, it's great. It's great. Okay, so, okay. Okay, I'm done. I think, I think I'll meet him at the cafe, and okay, things, things will work from then. I'll, I'll improvise. Great. <laughs> hey, Crystal, I need some advice here. What's up, George? So, there's this, like, red-headed girl in class, and I kind of got a crush on her, but... Mm. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I don't know, you know, how to ask her out. I don't, I don't even know if she knows my name, but, yeah. Oh, come you on. You got any advice? Um, I would personally just be natural and just go straight forward. Just go straight forward and... And ask her out. How I do that? Mm, I don't know. For my personal advice, I think you should just go straight forward and say, Hi, my name is George, and mm -hmm. give her an appearance. Hold on, I'm going to write this down. Okay. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> okay. And next step is if you are free, no, you always have to check if she's either married or if she's a lesbian mm -hmm. or if she is single. Okay. So number three is what you're looking for. Okay, number three. Mm. So if she's single, just say, hey, how about we go out for a cup of coffee or something? Mm -hmm. and, coffee. And yeah, that's how you get her. <laughs> So yeah, what what if she doesn't like coffee though? I mean, what 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 else could we do on a date? Mm. Uh, assuming she will say yes. Yeah, what's fun to do on a date anyway? Fun to do on a date is just the fact that you're being with her and just try to get her to know her more. Wait, 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 wait one sec. Do I need to pay for this or? <laughs> Um, I don't think you should pay on the first date. I I think sometimes that can be offensive to women. Oh, that's great because I'm totally broke. <laughs> I think you should just ask her casually, not like a date date. Just say, hey, I would like to know you a little bit more and just go out for a small little drink. Like, go to that new cafe that's open. Like... Like, mm -hmm. a lot of girls think that place is so cute. I think you should take her there. But I think cafes are boring. Cafes are boring. Men! <laughs> Women don't think so. Oh. This is the point. Oh, okay. Write it down. All right.